I'm Penelope Reed. I'm a barrister. I also sit as a Deputy High Court Judge and act as a mediator. There are really two possible tests for mental capacity to make a will. The first is the traditional test set out in Banks and Goodfellow. The testator has to have the capacity to broadly understand the assets that they are disposing of. The Banks and Goodfellow test requires that somebody understands those who have a claim to their bounty and that any disease or delusion is not affecting that ability. Against that is the mental capacity test that is set out in the Mental Capacity Act. That is far more about presuming that somebody has capacity, having some reassurance that they understand the effect of what they're doing, whereas in fact the Banks and Goodfellow test doesn't really have that aspect of matters in it. There is a tension between the two tests. There have been some cases where judges have suggested that having either test will result in the same result, so it may not be that actually changing the test will have any real impact. Judging capacity, especially retrospectively, is an incredibly difficult task. What you're essentially doing is trying to go into the mind of the person and figure out what they were thinking at the time, whether or not they understood and appreciated all the things that they should have been thinking about. There are often cases where one suspects that there has been undue influence, but proving it, particularly as undue influence happens behind closed doors, is extremely hard. The law has to grapple with this problem of testators being unreasonably and malignly influenced. Therefore, the medical evidence, it seems to me, is really important. Accessibility in terms of will making is really important. It is a judgment call for the will draftsman. Putting in, into place safeguards is all well and good, but it mustn't be at the expense of accessibility. The law changed during the pandemic to say that in certain circumstances, people could put wills in place and their two witnesses could witness the signature virtually from a video meeting. The expectation will increasingly be that things be done online. One of the things we're really worried about at Age UK is the numbers of older people who aren't online and the fact that more and more technology is coming along supposed to help them and very often does, but it's not much good if you can't take advantage of it. So whilst on the one hand, the idea of electronically signing a will might be very helpful to some older people, for others, I think it will feel very foreign and actually quite frightening. You never know who else is in the room when a meeting takes place virtually. You gain a lot of risk as a result. Clients often have difficulties understanding information. And so having someone that they're close to, that they trust, and who knows how to communicate with them is a really valuable tool in making sure that the information and the advice that we're trying to communicate gets through properly. On the flip side of that, clients who are in this twilight zone often are a bit more vulnerable to undue influence. Every so often, we'll ask for an in-person meeting with the client alone, go through that same information again and make sure that they have actually understood and don't feel like pressure is being placed on them by the presence of that third party in the room. The other thing you might want to try and do if they don't already have an attorney, then you can make an application to the Court of Protection for a deputy to be appointed. That attorney or deputy would then act as a barrier between the potential testator and these people who might be trying to take advantage of them. The Court of Protection's first and foremost concern is the person to whom the proceedings relate. The other thing that can be done if there is a power of attorney in place is to contact the Office of the Public Guardian, the OPG. One of the problems that I've come across is that often these cases involve compiling lots of evidence about a sort of very specific factual matrix or very subtle behaviours that have built up to build a bigger picture over a long period of time. The OPG is really overwhelmed in terms of its caseload and under-resourced. 
It's so important when you're taking instructions to remember that that person is the most important person. It's incumbent on us as their advisors to, to act exclusively in their best interests.